talking, as you can see here, about effective application materials. And before we start, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording and that, um, you know, if you, um, you know, we will usually we record and prevent presenter view so that I will only be visible. Um, but, it, you know, just so you know, you might actually like if you'd like to change your name or, you know, turn off your camera, um, feel free to do so. We also love to see your faces. So please do keep them on as well. Um, so uh, we'll just start off very quickly with a brief introduction to our office in case you are not sure of who we are. So um, I am Francesco Finelli, Associate Director of Graduate Career Development, and I'm here with my colleague, Rachel Bernard, who is Director um, of GSAS Compass, and we're a pretty new office. Um, but our mission is really to just help students identify and work towards their post-graduation career goals and making sure that you're really considering a range of careers that are suited to your interests, values, and personalities. And we really want to empower you to harness your academic training um, and any career path you pursue. So we're here to support you in that career development process. Now, uh, presentation goals for today. Um, do know that the focus of this presentation is job and industries, although um, many of the same um, you know, tips and tricks work for academic positions as well. But that's the, you know, we'll really be looking at job descriptions um, and tailoring your materials for positions in quote unquote industry. Um, so those are, you know, outside of academia. So today we're going to learn how to create a compelling resume or CV, draft an effective cover letter, tailor your materials to a job description, and then follow up on your application materials. And then we'll leave some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so first, I'd like to just launch a poll to get a sense of who's in our audience today. Um, so Rachel, if you don't mind launching that poll. I just launched it. Excellent. Thank you. All right. And people are starting to respond. Thank you. Yeah. Just to get just to get a sense of, of who's here today, what programs you're in, um, you know, what's your course of study uh, or your department, um, you know, and where are you in your job search? Uh, and just to it gives me a better sense of, um, you know, maybe what to focus on or maybe what to move through quickly today in, in today's presentation. Great. We'll give it just another couple seconds. There are a few people who are still entering their responses. Great. And five more seconds and then I'll end the poll. Okay. Okay. And um, Francesca, I know you can't see the results, but I shared them <laughs> with everybody else. So we have um, about of the 20 students who responded, 60% are masters, 40% are PhD. So even pretty even split. Area of study mm -hmm. is also very balanced. Um, a quarter in the humanities, a third in the social sciences and the rest in the natural sciences. And then in terms of where people are in their job search, um, half of you said you haven't started yet, but you're getting your materials ready. Um, Excellent. And then kind of a, <laughs> the other half is either, yeah, either started applying, applying to lots or unsure. Okay, so we're really across the spectrum here. I love it. We have a diverse audience. That's really exciting. Um, okay, and so uh, we're going to also just do a quick Mentimeter. I love these um, because, you know, you get a sense of uh, everyone can, it's interactive. So I'm going to just um, stop sharing for right now. And we're going to drop into the chat. Rachel's going to drop into a chat um, a question. And uh, I'm going to share my screen and I want to know like what's your um, here actually I want to know what is your, you know, biggest concern I guess about, uh, you know, cover letters, resume writing, what are you most concerned about. Um, and so let me just sorry I am going to. Ah, there we go. Now I can share. Okay. So I'm going to go into my Mentimeter and present. So what, what are your concerns? And um, everyone can kind of see. I'm going to share this. And as uh, your results come in, uh, you'll be able to um, see what your colleagues in the audience think about cover letters and resumes. So you know, I know some people think, um, how do I effectively share my 
you know, my materials or how do I talk about skills? Um, and, you know, if, if this doesn't seem to be working, do feel free to um, maybe just drop into the chat. Oh, here we are. Yes. Okay. Standing out in a pool of applicants. Yes. Agreed. Um, you know, it's really competitive right now, particularly, um, you know, I do think that there's also often concerns when I talk to students about um, exactly how to translate and quantify academic work into skills and years of experience and a job description. Hard to sound like yourself in a cover letter. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm worried about writing an effective cover letter. Um, I find it hard to brag about myself in an authentic voice. Yeah, format, relevant information, doing a CV resume being European, not af afraid of not having relevant experience or background, limitations. Yeah, okay, so thanks so much for your input. Um, and these are concerns that Rachel and I hear um, in, you know, a lot of our a majority of our one on one advising appointments and just to you know a plug for our office here. Um, today's presentation is really going to be a quick overview of um, application materials if you have specific questions um, and really need one on one assistance, please do make an appointment with us. Um, you know we have 30 minute cover letter and resume reviews uh, and we can really get into your specific questions and issues um, so please do you know never hesitate to reach out okay great so let me continue our presentation here so um let's think now about what is the purpose really of a resume and um, your resume and cover letter are really your marketing materials. They will get you through the door and help you land your dream job. Hiring managers or recruiters will only skim over your resume and cover letter for a few seconds. So it's extremely important to take the time to perfect these documents. And this is from an HR manager that I worked closely with um, at my previous job. And I really love this description. It's your marketing materials. And I agree with that. So what is really the difference between a resume and a CV? Because that question always comes up. So um, really, you know, a resume is a concise document that is a one or two pages long. It's a summary of uh, skills and your experiences, and it's best for applying to most industry positions. While a CV is really a comprehensive description of your academic and professional credentials, it's used to apply for academic and research positions, and it's really a more, oops, sorry about that, a more extensive listing of work experience, publications, teaching experience, and it can be multiple pages. So three, four, five pages. Um, and this is, again, I have uh, both versions. I have a CV and a resume. The CV acts as kind of like my master document with all of my information. And I pick and choose information that I want to feature on my resume, which is one page, depending on the type of position I'm applying to. Tailoring is so important, and I'll get into more about that later on in this presentation. So quickly, I know a lot of you know this, but again, I want to make sure you know what a resume should include. And that's, of course, your contact information. Um, if you don't want to include a full address, you can list just a zip code, but you should definitely have your email address, your phone number, um, a personal website, or a LinkedIn page. A LinkedIn page is kind of like an online CV. It's a re it can be a complete listing of all of your experiences. So I always like to include a LinkedIn page. And then, of course, your education. Do keep in mind that at this point, I just want to know about your undergraduate degrees and above. Do not include high school and travel abroad experiences if it fits. I don't know. Um, but I do think that that's something uh, it's not as important as maybe, you know, your undergraduate or a graduate degree. So also, um, you know, what else should a resume include? Experience, of course. And I think this is what a lot of people are concerned about, right? So how do I show my experience? And we'll discuss that. So it really should include paid and unpaid work, internships, volunteer experiences relevant to any job. And so you want to include an organizational name, a location, dates of employment, and your title. We're going to be looking at some sample materials a little bit later in today's presentation. Um, and so you'll see all of this information included. And so really in the experience underneath each description or each underneath each experience, you want a brief description of your accomplishments and bullet points. I see people who use, um, you know, full sentences. I, I think that that's okay if you really prefer it. However, I do think, again, thinking back to what Julia said right at the start of our presentation, people are only spending a couple of minutes. So if you start with an action verb, 
get going, let the person know right away, get a full, um, you know, an understanding of your experience. It's a, it's a quick way to convey information through bullet points. So, and you want to put everything in reverse chronological order. And so how do you create a bullet point with impact? Um, and so really, you know, it's, it's important to, um, so there's this method that you want to be specific as possible and be explicit within your role and projects. And so there's a method called STAR method to help you kind of create a framework. So STAR is situation, task, action, results. What was the situation or problem you were facing? What tasks did you identify in response to that issue? What actions did you take? So then those are your action verbs. And then what was the result? And this is really important. So what was the outcome or result of your, um, of your actions? How did it benefit the organization? And can this be quantified? Um, and so Rachel, maybe we can just quickly launch the poll about um, resumes. Um, and I think I've given the answers to a few of them at some point at this point, but um, I'd also like to think about um, what's, you know, what's your favorite uh, action verb? Um, you know what, let's, let's do that. Let's, let's switch gears. Let's just throw it into the chat. Tell me what's your favorite uh, action verb? Um, Actually, I launched the poll already. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, I, I don't, I, I only see me talking bar, so I don't see anyone else in the, the audience. So um, yeah, it's, it's strange presenting to a digital audience, y'all. Yeah. Um, People are responding now. Um, great. Vote on what they think is the strongest bullet point and then what order uh, re uh, information should be presented. About half of people voted. So we'll give people a few, a few more seconds to read these ponder the questions. Yeah, it's also difficult that the presenter can't see the poll at all. Yeah. <laughs> another layer of fun. Okay. Uh, Give these last few people another few seconds to vote. Great. And then we'll end the poll. Okay, so I'm going to end it. Okay and share the results, um, which means everybody but Francesca can see the results. So um, the vote for the strongest bullet point. Um, so the first choice was worked on multiple projects with team members. The second, lead a team of five in developing a website for clients. And then the mm -hmm. third, arranged catering, travel and lodging for week long, 39% academic workshop with 25% international participants. Um, so 65% of you thought that the last one um, was the best. Um, one third of you thought the middle one was the best. Um, and one person liked the first one. Um, the okay. First one. And then in terms of the order in which information should be presented, 85% mm -hmm. um, thought it should be in reverse chronological order. Um, and 15% thought it should be in order of most important information to least important information. Okay, great. Well, thanks for, for that rundown, Rachel. So it is reverse chronological order, but we can talk in a minute. I'll talk about um, section headers and how you can kind of finagle um, a way of putting your most important information first, even if everything is still in reverse chronological order. Um, and then the bullet points, I personally think the, the last one, uh, the one with kind of all the details, really talking about the results, giving quantifying an experience of organizing events and meetings, who was in the audience? Who were you organizing it for? How often? So being as specific as possible is really the goal of an effective and strong um, bullet point. So let's, let's again, just to kind of hit this home one more time. So here's a generic description, right? Uh, an events coordinator res responsible for organizing events and panels. I don't really know like what they did or what kind of events they organized. And so you really miss a chance to showcase your relevant skills that you use to carry out a task. So this is a much more specific description. So plan and coordinate panels on public health for audiences of 25 to 50 undergraduates on a bi-monthly basis. I know who you're doing it for, undergraduates, how many people are in the audience, and how often are you doing these? Great, I love that information. It gives me a really full picture of what you're doing. And then 
excuse me, identify and contact health professionals in a community to participate in panels. You're acting as a liaison. That shows that you know how to act between um, someone in your office and maybe someone else in the community. That's a really important skill to have. And then create marketing materials and publicize events through social media. I had no idea that that was what this person was doing in that previous bullet. So, you know, try and be as detailed and illustrative as possible. Um, and if you have questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to drop them into the chat. Rachel can modify, uh, I mean, moderate. Um, and so, you know, uh, please do feel free to, This is, you know, I want to make this as interactive as possible. So if you have questions, please do just drop them in. So let's talk about strong action verbs. Um, so what are some good ones? So let's think about, and I can't read this now because my Zoom bar is in the way. Let's put this down here. Great. Leader, leadership. So you can say managed, led, oversaw, trained, taught, tutored, mentored, drove a project, right? These are all really exciting action verbs. And you don't want to repeat the same word again and again, worked on, worked on, worked on, or like led, taught, tutored, tutored, tutored. You know, it's kind of boring. There aren't many words on a resume, so make sure it's exciting. So here's a couple of different options. And, um, oops, here, let me, Oh, there we go. So outcomes, produced, developed, creative, innovated, completed, published, an analytical, analyzed, research, investigated, communication, wrote, edited, presented. So um, planned, coordinated, you know, these are all really strong. I love hacked details. <laughs> I hacked into something. Um, but these are like a verbs to avoid. So they're less descript descriptive, like helped, assisted, did, worked on, went to, right? All of these other verbs are so much more powerful and descriptive and illustrative. So, um, and I, I'm not sure because I can't see the chat, but um, Rachel, if you don't mind dropping in CCE's um, Design Your Next Steps, they have an amazing list of action verbs that you can use on your CV and resume. So let's talk about transferable skills that all graduate students develop during their time. Because people say, you know, I have so much research, how do I then go ahead about you know, kind of featuring this. So everyone uh, in a graduate program will develop these skills, which is think about research skills, right? So you're determining the best approach to a question. You're finding relevant data, maybe designing a way to analyze it, understanding large amounts of data, and then synthesizing your findings, and then persuading others and defending your conclusions. These are all like great bullet points that you could have. Um, so, you know, I think it's oftentimes students are like, oh, I've spent so much time studying it, but I don't have any skills or like I've spent so much time in school, but I don't know what my skills are. You have these skills and you, these are usually the buckets that they fall within. So it's research, written communication. So this could be writing a paper for classes or your thesis, of course, or a dissertation. Project management, think about breaking down a large project like your dissertation into small pieces. Um, think about time management, um, you know, having to be self-sufficient and organizing yourself uh, in your writing project and then working with deadlines. So this could be for a class. Uh, this could be for when, you know, certain um, parts of your thesis or dissertation are due. So you can call that project management. Um, leadership, this can be mentoring or teaching or coaching or, um, you know, interacting, uh, being a class representative, um, volunteer opportunities. These are all leadership. And then critical thinking. So you approach problems systematically within your graduate programs. You see links between ideas, evaluate arguments, analyze information to draw your own conclusions. So again, I, I'm trying to just give you the language here to develop these bullet points. And um, you know, I hope that you can kind of take these away and think about how have you applied these buckets in your own work. Collaboration, knowing how to divide up tasks. You need to have a good relationship with others communicate effectively and resolve conflict. This is huge. Um, one of the best behavioral questions in interviews is how do you deal with difficult personalities or when uh, someone else in your, um, maybe someone in your group hasn't completed part of their project, what do you do? And so, um, you know, this is school projects. Um, this is working with people in a lab um, and, you know, just being in a classroom, right? That's collaboration with others. And then of course, public speaking. And so this can be a class presentation. This can be going to conference talks, poster presentations, and of course, teaching. Um, so, you know, again, using these skills, these are these, these big buckets that a lot of you are developing these skills. 
Francesca, there was a good question in the chat that I thought I would okay. just bring up. Um, yeah, please. It, it goes with this, um, which is how many bullet points should there be underneath hmm. um, any given position? That's a really great, great question. And I think it really um, depends. I like to think about it in, um, again, uh, importance. So if there's a position uh, or an experience that you have that's directly related to a job that you are applying to, make sure that that section in that experience has a nice level of bullet points. And when I say a lot of bullet points, that maybe means five or six. Um, I don't think that you should, I mean, you know, again, I don't want to give any like hard numbers here because if you need more bullet points, then go ahead and, and take them. But I do think that that's, and please jump in Rachel here, if you have a, a strong feeling about number of bullet points. Um, but another rule of thumb is like, you should probably have less bullet points if the position is older, um, maybe it's not as relevant, but you just still want to show maybe the experience. Um, so maybe only one or two bullet points. Um, also, if you've been at a position, let's say you're a research assist assistant for an entire year, um, that should probably have a lot more bullet points than maybe the summer internship that you did. So think about it strategically, not only in length of time that you were there, you probably want to have more bullets in a position you were in longer. And then also, if the position is really relevant to a job, then you want to make sure that you have more bullet bullet points in that um, area. And again, we'll look at some examples later on in this presentation. I think it will kind of show that. Um, but yeah, Rachel, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that too? Yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think um, I, I talk a lot about like real estate on a resume and how you want it to be proportional to how much attention you want to draw to something and how relevant it is. So basically exactly what you said. I do mm -hmm. think like there isn't ever really a need for more than five bullets um, mm -hmm, to describe mm -hmm. something that's probably just going to be too much. And it's yeah. also appropriate to have only one if something's you know older or less relevant. Um, so there's actually just one other question that I think um, could be a clarifying question for some students at this point that might be sure. addressing. And it's, um, so you have all these skills up on this slide and where would these, what section would these skills go? Uh, where would these go on a resume? And I'll just, hmm. I'll start answering that, which is, these are actually skills that you want to be brought out through your bullet points. So you're not gonna mm -hmm. like, so you want them to be interspersed throughout and attached to particular experiences. Um, and um, you, so you don't, like in a skills section, it's really like technical skills and language skills, but to demonstrate your research, um, communication, project management, you'd want it to just really be peppered throughout using that great variety of action verbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not just one section, it's throughout the entire document. Um, yeah, thank you for, thank, great questions. Um, thank you. So I think we'll move on if, uh, okay. So what other sections should you have, right? Uh, volunteer leadership. So um, this is really good for those without like, um, you know, professional office experience. Um, I think leadership and volunteer experiences are just as valuable. So make sure you're featuring those. And then skills, you should definitely have a skill section. Um, and so when I talk about these skills, I mean hard skills. So that's computer skills, technical skills, lab skills, and research skills that you have. Um, and then you can also have a section for languages. Um, but I want to go back to skills here because I said hard skills. Um, and then there's soft skills. So that's the communication. That's the leadership. That's the project management. That's the collaboration. And, you know, um, I have seen people have a section for soft skills on their resume. Um, but I think that those soft skills are shown through your bullet points and your cover letter more so than uh, needing a section on it. Um, so, you know, that's just you know my my uh, my input there, but and do do include your languages, and then um, have uh, you know fluent conversational elementary. Do include a level too. I think that's helpful for the reader. Okay, and then some other optional sections: a uh, profile or a summary, um, honors and publications. These are all things that you could also include. Um, a summary is really appropriate if you're making uh, a transition into a different industry where your skills are transferable. Um, it's also maybe if you um, want to highlight a large amount of experience in a small, uh, you know, little about section up at the top, I'll show you a summary example um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. And then, of course, 
honors, I usually say, put them up underneath education, um, if that makes sense, if they're all related to your educational um, experiences. If not, then have a section for awards. There's so many different things you can do with a resume. So, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of flexibility here, although you need to stay kind of within a very strict format. <laughs> so I'm kind of contradicting myself with that statement, but, um, you know, you have to see what works best for you in the job description. So again, so this resume summary. So it's a, it's a really, it's a, it's a profile. It can be helpful to include if you have a, a eclectic background or several years of experience or in the process of changing careers. And, um, you know, it's a brief snapshot of your highlight, skills, experience, accomplishment, knowledge, or education. And it connects you to your background with a specific field or position. And these summaries can be even really helpful for you to write, to be like, oh yeah, uh, how do my skills fit into this job? Um, if you can describe them in a summary and put them at the top of your resume, excellent. You're ready for an interview even. Um, it should be approximately two to five phrases. It can be written in paragraph or bullet form. And these are some section headers. You could say summary of qualifications, career profile, career highlights, professional summary, or just summary or profile works too. And then it's not necessary if you're a current student or recent grad with a background that like directly connects to your target industry. So again, this is totally optional. Okay, so how to feature, again, your graduate education on your resume. So we talked about some, some transferable skills, and now I want you to think about redefining your experience because your graduate degree really is a job. And so um, feature your coursework in the education sections to give employers a better understanding of your degree. So, um, you know, usually uh, there's like you know, you might want to list your education and then underneath you could list uh, your thesis topic and then maybe related courseworks. Um, and, you know, this is a way to kind of fill out a degree, uh, your resume and make it more, um, have, give the, you know, because some MA positions or, or some PhD programs, you know, um, someone might not be as knowledgeable about kind of the courses that you're taking um, and, or the research that you're doing. So give a, a fuller picture of that. Um, and then you could list your thesis or your dissertation under your experience section and provide bullet points like managed a year long thesis project, wrote an X page thesis or dissertation on the subject of, um, led lecture and seminar size class sections on you know, topics, conducted archival research, um, developed a novel procedure, uh, and you know, put it right underneath your experience. So redefine this idea of experience. And I think that you'll find that you actually have a lot of experience. <laughs> and then, as I said, volunteered positions or unpaid positions to definitely be featured. And these show interests outside of your academic work and are really valuable experiences to learning new skills. So please do feature those. Um, and then, as I said, use section high, high headers to really highlight your skills. Um, and so, in, like the traditional section headers are like education, experience, skills. I'd like you to reimagine this and think about some other areas. And so you can really use these headers to demonstrate particular sets of competencies or experiences. So you can say leadership and management experience, communications experience, consulting experience. You can read this list. It goes on and on. Laboratory experience, curatorial experience, nonprofit work experience, right? All of this is, um, these are great section headers. And if a job requires technical experience, that's your first he section header, technical experience. And then you list it. And um, what is nice is so people were saying, I said, you need everything needs to be in reverse chronological order, right? In your sections. However, if you have a technical experience that's maybe a little older, but it's very directly related to the job, you could put a new section header that says instead of just everything underneath experience, it says technical experience. And then underneath you have that job that's really relevant, but not the most recent. And then maybe underneath you have your teaching and mentoring experience that has the most recent job. Um, so I, I hope that's clear in the way that you can use sections to then put the most important experience first and still be in the reverse chronological format that most employers expect to see. Um, so, you know, this is a really new way, I think, of kind of looking at resumes in that non-traditional um, kind of just experience. Break it up into different areas and sections. All right, what should it not include? Personal information. So for especially particularly Europeans, um, you know, or, or, or people, international students, we do not include your age, your marital status, 
your number of children or maybe even pictures, your social security number, all of this should not be on a resume. So please do uh, remove them if you're applying to positions in the United States. Also make sure you have an appropriate email address. So I'm saying inappropriate, it's like, you know, panda bear 44 at hotmail.com. Like maybe, you know, use your name or something that's a little more descriptive of who you are. Um, and I always get the question, should you use a Columbia email address or your personal email address? I don't really care. I don't think employers care. Just list only one email address and list the one you check the most often. If you wanna be affiliated with Columbia, use the Columbia email address. If you only use your personal email address more often, use that one, as long as it's a, an appropriate one. Okay, so objective statements. I don't think that these are necessary. Like seeking a position in the finance industry, use your cover letter to emphasize your interest in the position and how your background relates to it. Repetition of words, as I said, don't need responsibilities, duty, duty, you know, things like that. Don't, don't repeat them. Full sentences, unless in your summary section. And then references, I always say, just put references available upon request, unless the job description asks for them. However, I always like to create a separate sheet that um, I have my resume and then I uh, attach to it a second page that says, that has the same header as my resume, all my contact information, and then I list my references. Um, also saying, uh, if, if a job description does not require them uh, to be sent in with your application materials, saying available upon request allows you to control the process of contacting people for references. If someone's asking for references, you're probably pretty close to getting a job. So you want to maybe contact that reference and say, hey, I just gave your contact information to XYZ company. We expect a call from them. Here's my most updated resume. Here's my here's the job description, so that that reference is ready to talk about you and your skills and how they relate to the job. Um, you know, when they get that call, and it's respectful of them to let them know that they you know they should expect a call. Um, always make sure you get approval if you're listing anyone in a reference. Um, so just make sure that so you want to make sure that they're going to be able to say good things on your behalf. All right, typos, spelling mistakes, grammatical errors. They do not belong on a resume, they'll get you thrown out So uh, of the pile. Common mistakes, so that would be overselling yourself. And so um, I know someone said they were worried about kind of boasting. Um, I think that as long as you've done it, it's not boasting. Um, but if you're overselling in a way that saying, um, you know, I have five years of experience and you maybe only have two, that's overselling, right? Um, not putting uh, the most important information first, including older or relevant experience. So um, I saw recently, you know, like something from 2015 on a student's resume um, that was like a tutor position. Um, and then they had a tutor position more recently and they have listed both, both of them. And I said, you know what, get rid of that older one because you're still showing that experience in a more recent relevant way. Um, and giving too much information. So that's like crowding a resume. The first thing I always do is look at a resume and say, do I even want to read this document? Because if it's way too overcrowded with information, no one wants to read it. So just kind of keep that in mind. Have, have white space, space, use bold, use italics to make information stand out. So when someone's reading it really quickly, they get a sense of you. Uh, and then don't use uh, abbreviations or technical words. You know, I, I do want to also say, though, for certain industries, that is important. So, um, you know, uh, also show your resume, make a one-on-one -on -one appointment with us, show it to an advisor, show it to um, someone working in the industry. It's so important to get lots of feedback on your resume. Everyone's going to have differing opinions. Take what you want and throw out the rest. All right. So pro tip here, we're going to tailor your resume. So this is what's going to make it stand out. And um, you use the keywords and phrases from a job description and you make sure that those words are used throughout your resume as well as your cover letter. And we're gonna talk about cover letters in a minute, but how do you tailor the resume? So as I said, review the job description. What I do, and I'll show you in a moment, is you usually highlight. Uh, I like to print it out or make a PDF of it and actually highlight the job description. And um, think about words that are used more often or really important words that you wanna make sure those words are in your document. And then reflect on your experiences. How can you prove to the reader that you have these required skills? Um, and then show them, don't just tell them, show them through your bullet points. 
So use keywords. Can you rearrange your sections to better fit the description? Sit down and write it. <laughs> and then it's helpful, as I said, to create a template resume that you can change according to the job description. Um, so you might have different versions of your resume depending on the types of jobs you're applying to. So let's say you're applying to museum positions um, and also communications positions. So maybe you have a position that really highlights your curatorial or museum experience. And then the other document really shows highlights times that you've been in charge of communications, um, maybe even within a museum setting, right? So uh, you're going to highlight different things and, and maybe even highlight different experiences. Um, you know, maybe certain experiences will not be featured on the museum resume and might be featured on the communications one. So that's why I was talking about having a master CV document with all of your experiences. So you can maybe just grab that experience, pop it in. Um, you're not spending tons of time tailoring your resume because I know it's time consuming, um, but it really is super important and it's how you stand out in a stack of applications. And then when you're applying to positions, uh, oh, I said this already, um, have different versions. And then have a parent, a friend, a mentor, a career advisor, review it for errors and get feedback. So um, let's let's look at some um, samples. And you know what, actually, I think, I think I'm gonna talk about cover letters first and then we can do them as a package. Um, because I have a couple that I'd like to look with. So uh, let's launch that poll. Let's get the blood flowing. Let's get our minds thinking a little bit about cover letters. So if you don't mind um, launching that, Rachel, uh, that would be helpful. I just launched it. Thank you. Let's see what the audience thinks about cover letters. Because I get the question all the time. Does it even matter? <laughs> um, and I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> right. Votes are coming in. Great. All right, five more seconds for the last few folks. All right, I'm going to close the poll mm -hmm. and share the results. So are cover letters an important part of your application? 63% said yes, um, a quarter said sometimes, and then two people think no one reads them. Uh, and then what is the purpose of a cover letter is like is pretty evenly split. Um, a lot of so to tell the employer more about your interests, um, to tell the employer about your soft skills, such as communication and time management skills. Both of those had about half of people. Um, the one that was least, uh, only 25% thought that it's uh, to show an employer how you write and think. Um, the one mm -hmm. that there was most agreement on is the last one, to tell the employer why you want to work with their company. Yeah, so it's all of the above on that one. Um, <laughs> you're doing all of those things. So that's great that it was evenly distributed. And yeah, you definitely want to tell the employer why you want to work for them. That is a really important part, but you're doing everything within the cover letter. Um, and then that first one. So I think it's, um, so this is, this is the thing. It really depends on who's reading your application. I've talked to hiring managers who say, I always read the cover letter. It's so important to me. I really want to get a sense of the person and why they want to work for us and about their skills and their writing and how they think, all of these things. And then I talk to a hiring manager who says, oh, I never read the cover letter. It's just, I look at the resume. If it interests me, I'll bring them in. So it really depends. And you don't want to uh, be caught sending your uh, application materials and they request a cover letter to someone who loves a cover letter and it's not a strong cover letter. So it's really important to have a strong document. And I know that it takes a lot of time to make one, but I want to give you some tips on how to create a kind of a standard draft that you can then just change and edit um, as you apply to positions. Um, and you know, you might want to spend more time on an application that you're really excited about than the position that you're kind of lukewarm about, but you feel like you fit and you match the description. So do also kind of um, 
you know, set boundaries for yourself with um, how long you're spending on these documents. But as I said, I want to give you a general overview of what they should look like so you can create a strong cover letter because again, it really depends on who you are writing to. I know sometimes they don't ask for cover letters anymore. And I think a summary or profile on your resume can act as a cover letter instead. Um, so do, don't, you know, miss out on the opportunity to really talk about those soft skills. Um, and be more descriptive to the employer about your skills, your experiences, and why you want to work for that company, of course, too. So let's talk, what does Julia say? Said she likes to call them the gateway to getting an interview. It's your unique story. Tell your narrative through experiences. Be genuine, honest, and stay away from cliches like team player. Instead, talk about situations where you prove to be all those things. So show, don't tell. Um, so before you start writing, I want you to think about research the employer, uh, review their website if you can, speak with a current employee or maybe read articles about the company, use social media sites and get a really general sense of the, of, of the company. And then think about um, if you can find a specific contact. So you can do research through LinkedIn or research uh, an a HR rep on the firm's website. Uh, next Friday at the same exact time, we'll be talking about how to use LinkedIn. So I could talk for a full hour about how to use LinkedIn. I don't have the time to do it now, but you should be trying to find a specific contact to write to. And if you can't, that's okay. You can just say to whom it may concern, or excuse me, I usually like the, you can say that to whom it may concern, but I like to say dear, uh, you know, XYZ company staff. You're personalizing it. You're making it more modern. Um, who says to whom it may concern anymore, honestly. Okay, analyze the job description. So again, just in the same way, before you sit down to write your resume, right? You're doing the same thing. You're identifying keywords and you're gonna make reference to them. And then analyze your background. What have you done that is similar to the duties of the job? Um, and then, you know, convey that. So I, again, this is the format, okay? First paragraph, you wanna have an introduction. So you wanna say what position you're applying to, where you found the job, the name of the company or contact or connection that you have. If you don't have one, that's all right, just skip over that. And then a short summary of your education and your years of experience. So again, all of this is in the first paragraph. So if they only read that first paragraph, they get a lot about you. And then express your interest in working for the company by demonstrating you've done your research and you're familiar with their projects uh, or you know their, the way that they do their work or their clients. And then you wanna have a nice statement of confidence. So that's like, I'm, you know, certain that I will be a good fit for this position. Now, I know to some of you that might sound like boasting, but um, in America, uh, you know, we, um, it, we don't think of it really as boasting, to be honest with you. It's having confidence. And I think in the job search process in the United States, having confidence is of the utmost importance. And um, as someone who doesn't always feel confident myself, uh, I think that sometimes I can fake it <laughs> and then it becomes confidence, right? The person on the other side doesn't know that you don't feel confident, right? They never know that. So um, have a statement of confidence. I don't think it's considered boasting. All right, then the second, these are these body paragraphs. So underneath that, it's usually one or two body paragraphs. And so you really wanna highlight your experiences, your qualifications, um, give specific examples and try to organize your paragraphs around maybe one or two experiences. Um, so one can be about your internship, another can be about maybe writing your dissertation, um, or it can be organized around skills or, um, you know, the first pair, the first um, paragraph is all about your communication skills and the next paragraph is all about your, um, you know, time management skills or something like that. So then how, and then communicate how they would actually be valuable to the employer. So bring it back to them. I always, I hope to bring these skills to your office, something like that. And then highlight your soft skills that we've talked about, right? So then you have your conclusion and that's thanking the reader for their time and their consideration, reaffirm your interest in the position, reemphasize why you want to work there, and then offer any contact information so they know how to contact you. And then be confident. So we're going to look at some examples. Um, and so the first one will be, um, I'm actually going to use a sample uh, resume and cover letter for a position from a master's student. And then I'll be using one from Imagine PhD. So I am just going to escape this. And I want to bring up my, I'm going to do a new share here. 
Okay, so you can see my full screen now. And let's look at these PDFs. All right, so here's the position, okay? We're, we're talking about tailoring right now. So this is for staff editor of foreign affairs. And so I've gone ahead and I've highlighted, this is the first part, you do your research before you start writing your documents. So you're gonna join a fast paced team dedicated to publishing expert analysis of current events. You're gonna serve as a general article editor working on both print and online. And then you're gonna be editing pieces, generating story ideas and assisting with other publication related tasks. So you're going to edit, improve readability, confirm to their style, conform to their style, confer with authors, collaborate with experts, generate article ideas, so on and so forth, okay? And so this is really, um, and then you're gonna look at qualifications. So they want one year of experience, ideally working in both print and web. They want exceptional writing and editing skills, familiarity with online and print, passion for foreign affairs, ability to work on deadline, interact well with staff, have strong computer and web skills, okay? So I'd say with a position, every position you should be doing this, go ahead and highlight it, sit down, think about, in the, you know, and then you wanna ask yourself, how does my experience uh, draw to that? And then, and then here, learn a little bit about the company too, right? So they're really leading independent nonprofit membership organization, um, disseminate, uh, disseminating foreign policy ideas, and it's dedicating to increasing America's understanding of the world and contributing ideas to U.S. foreign policy. Cool job, right? Exciting. So let's see the sample um, cover letter that was written. So usually in an application, you want to start with a cover letter first, and then um, the next document in your application package would be your resume. It's an introduction to you and your experience. Um, so as you can see here, and um, I just wanna bring up to, hold on one, forgot to bring this up. Apologies, one moment. So um, here we are in the sample publishing resume. So, oh, don't look at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, here is the, re so here's the resume, here's the cover letter. Look how nicely they work together. It's the same type, type uh, same font. It's all one nice package together, okay? And so it's to the staff editor of position and they're writing it to someone specific. They found this person on the website, okay? Now, this is, someone said, how do I show my personality through a cover letter? This is a long cover letter, but it's also for an editorial position. So it makes sense why it's so long, right? Um, your cover letter for other positions might not be as long. Um, and so this person go ahead, goes ahead and writes exactly why they're interested in the position because they saw um, who, uh, you know, this individual speak at Columbia and they talked about how, um, you know, it is really important to, um, and he worked at foreign affairs. So, you know, thinking about how to make work accessible to a primetime audience, um, understanding and contextualizing the world of today, okay? So he starts actually with like a description of why he was even interested in the position. And then it says it closely mirrors my goals as a professional editor and scholar. I've chosen a career in serious nonfiction editorial work precisely because I believe that scholarly work when translated and effective, effectively for general audience can be a tremendous impact on how society understands how we function today. So mirroring saying my interests align with yours, that's really powerful. And if they don't really align, maybe you don't wanna to apply to the position, right? So this is actually a good test. Can you write an effective cover letter? Because if you can't, maybe it's not the best position to be applying to. Okay, so I can think of no better way to support this as an editor scholar as being part of the editorial team of foreign affairs. So he tells me uh, why he's applying, who he is, um, and you know, a brief introduction to, to himself. And then now his, his body paragraphs, he's organizing them around experience. So here's professional experience that he has, and then here's academic experience. And so I've highlighted things. Um, I have to effectively balance my time between various pressing projects, use advanced calendar organizational systems, as well as learning on my past editorial experience has allowed me to consistently finish projects ahead of deadline. So he doesn't just say I have great editorial, I mean, excuse me, time management skills and I can work in a fast paced environment. He shows me 
how he did that in a professional setting, which is so important. Um, and then he talks about how he worked on web publications. Remember, that was part of the job description. And he worked, he collaborated with the director in chief on commission and evaluated articles. Remember that job description? He's done all of it, right? And then he's initiated and authored premium paid a newsletter. So he's generated content himself, which was in the job description. And he, um, you know, uh, had to adhere. Um, oh, so that now here he's showing, uh, he hopes to bring all of these skills that he's gained in previous positions to his role at foreign affairs. Always bring it back to them, right? That's a great way to, uh, you know, people always wanna know, what are you gonna do for my company? So then he talks about his uh, academic training and how that made him really interested in political science and international relations. Um, and, you know, he really thinks that it will make him very prepared for the position at foreign affairs. Finally, I love this paragraph because it shows personality. Um, and so, you know, maybe this cover letter isn't following, um, you know, every standard in a way you need to make it your own. But I love that he says down here, uh, in addition to strong time management practices, I find that one of the best strategies for handling, efficiently handling most multiple pressing deadlines is to cultivate a collegial and supportive workplace. Um, and, you know, he likes to help others and those around him to perform to the highest level while enjoying a few laughs together along the way. So that shows personality. And that makes me be like, oh, this, you know, I get a sense of who this person is. And, you know, you don't have to tell someone your entire life history and why you wanted to become a, you know, a editor because you started reading at the age of, you know, two, which is amazing. Um, you know, I don't need that life story. Uh, but I do like to know about what you bring in your personality. Um, and then he tells them when they're available to start immediately. And I hope to speak to you further. So um, that is the cover letter. And here's the resume. So let's take a look. So he has a summary up here. And so he gives a, an overview. He says graduate student, over three years of combined professional experience and project management. And um, he likes to work with a social mission. Gives me information about the degree. Again, you know, um, uh, also puts the, the scholars and awards up underneath experience. And then here's professional experience. And I really love the way that bold and italics are used in this in a way that I can quickly zoom out and get a real sense of this person's experience just through the bolding. He went, where did he go to school and where did he work? Here's the section for publications. And then here's skills and languages. Okay, and so as you can see, each of them have about, this one has three bullet points, two, three, three, okay? So, um, you know, I think that this is a, a nice effective, um, you know, application for this position. So now imagine PhD, Rachel, if you don't mind dropping that into a link into this, it's a great program platform about career exploration for social sciences and humanities, although uh, PhD students, although I think it's really helpful for MA students, I think it's really helpful also even for natural science students. And so, um, okay, so in here each, so within um, here, you know what, I'll, I'll just quickly um, show you, well, on Imagine PhD, which is amazing, is that um, they have job families and you can learn more about specific job families. So I've, and then they have application materials for that job family. So I took analysis and research. And so um, this is a job ad for a position as a researcher at Frameworks Institute. And they've highlighted specific keywords. Again, same thing, right? What's the most important part here? Um, and then your required skills, um, you know, demonstrated ability to distill and interpret complicated, complicated research findings, create clear, high quality products for a non-academic audience. And then here's the duties and responsibilities, right? So really kind of, and they give you these bubbles on the side here about like why it's important, okay? So, um, you know, notice the, the, the emphasis on the organization's mission and address how it aligns with your beliefs. We talked about that, right? Um, and then familiarize yourself with the industry processes, um, address requirement to the, so you always, if there's required skills, you should be addressing those in your cover letter for sure and through your resume. And then think about projects or presentations you've delivered to non-specialists. Um, publics, and then use that star situation, the star method to show that um, in your bullets, right? So let's let's uh, move down here and, and you can find this online. So here's the person's um, 
uh, uh, re resume in response to that job description. So here's a professional summary. I really like this a lot. Um, so kind of synthesizing all of their, you know, many years of experience into a short, really concise couple of sentences. Strong researcher with advanced proficiency in qualitative and quantitative methods, committed to building support for social issues and applied experience in advocacy organizations. So right there, you're checking some boxes of the job description. They wanted quantitative and qualitative methods. They wanted you to be able to be aligned with their social mission and have excellent communication skills. And then they can craft Strat, uh, excuse me, um, excellent communication skills with a focus on effective strategies to craft persuasive arguments and address a range of specialists and general audiences. Remember, that was a big highlight on there. Again, right away on that professional summary. Then we have your education. And so, you know, they went right, at, they didn't give me like the MPhil, the MA, um, they just said the PhD in history. You don't, I don't need it to be really descriptive of each of the degrees that you got on your way to a PhD, okay? Um, if you want to include them, you can. Um, experience. So they're putting their doctoral candidate underneath the experience. Remember I said, rethink your experience. So, and then they gave me a really clear outline of what they did, teaching assistant, volunteer researcher. So again, a lot of these people might be like, right, is this experience? It most certainly is and make sure it's there. And then we have graduate assistant and then publications, selected conference presentations, additional professional skills and training. Um, and so I like this because they show me exactly like the hard skills that they might know. So these programs, as well as the fact that they have demographic methods and survey design, they're proficient in that, right? talk about your level of uh, experience within them. And then they've done extensive seminar in social science research methods, and eth eth ethnography, oral uh, interviews, topic modeling, and data analysis for the University of Michigan. So, um, you know, I think that this is, um, you know, we can really go into further depth about this, but I know we're probably running out of time or over time. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing, oops, Doing applications really takes time. The process is challenging. Uh, just because you're not getting responses doesn't mean you're not experienced, doesn't mean you're a bad candidate. It's just, it's really competitive right now. And there's not many jobs out there and a lot of people are applying for them. So be realistic, understand it's gonna be a challenge. So don't give up, come make an appointment with Rachel or I, we will build you back up, give you some confidence, um, you know, maybe test some of those faulty thinking that, oh, I, maybe I'm not receiving responses because I, you know, I'm not a good candidate. You are, you're, you all will find jobs. I promise. Sometimes it just takes a long time. And right now it's taking about six months to find a job. So keep that in mind. Um, it can take less or more time, uh, but that's what we're looking at right now. All right. So thank you for being patient with me. Um, you know, I know again, we're a little over, uh, but